Hello there. Radio One proudly presents in two programs the members of Queen talking about themselves and their music. Queen, as they are now, were formed in February 1971 and have become one of the most successful rock acts in the world, with over six major albums and ten hit singles. Well, let me introduce you now to the members of Queen. First of all, vocalist and piano player... Freddie Mercury. <laughs> on guitar and arranging and writing... Brian May, I'm here. On drums... And occasional vocals, Roger Taylor. Yeah. Welcome, Roger. And on bass and electric piano... Uh, John Deacon. Right. Together they've sold over 40 million records worldwide. That's quite something. And first of all, if I can ask you, Freddie, how did it all begin? Uh, very sort of briefly. Brian and Roger, they were in a sort of very up-tempo, raucous band called Smile. And I used to be in another band um, called Wreckage or something. Even I more up-tempo. The even name more, Wreckage. Even more, even more up-tempo. And we used to be friends, I mean, you know, going to college together and a sort of met up. And after sort of a couple of years of knowing each other, we just decided um, we'd form a band together, really. As simple as that. We thought our musical ideas would um, blend. Mm. Then we met John and decided to call the band Queen. Roger, can we go to uh, the beginnings of the group? You and Freddie were working, or you had a stall, right, in the Kensington ah, market? Yes, partners in crime. Partners in crime. Um, yes, it was really just, a, it was more of a sort of social centre, I think, at the time. At the time, that Queen was sort of in its formative stages, and we were going through all their traumas with trying to find somebody to manage us and find a record wow. company, etc. We sort of uh, slogged our way around, made some demo tapes, etc., through some friends, and then sort of hawked them round the business, as it was, and still is, Eventually, sort of securing ourselves several companies who were interested, we then did a gig, I think it was at King's College, mm. somewhere down in South London, and uh, got a load of record companies along. And, and then we started to sort of uh, try and wheel and deal a bit our way into a sort of good recording situation. How long did it take you from the time that you'd made the demo to the time that you actually got a recording contract? Ooh. It felt like about 80 years, I think. It was a long time. It was about two years. <laughs> yeah, it was about it? 18 months, two years, yeah. There was a... A, great, Brian, a yes. great deal of feeling of frustration at the time. The first album w was really old songs by the time it came out, as far as we were concerned. And uh, it put us in a strange position because there were a lot of... We were sort of one of the groups who came along with a show and a sort of an idea of a complete production as a stage show and everything. Whereas by the time the record came out, and particularly by the time w it got played by anyone and all this, I mean, it takes so long to get things going, it was all sounding like old news, you know, so people were inclined to tag us as the tail end of Glitter Rock or something. We've had a, a fairly, um, fairly sour relationship with the music press, as, as, as it's called in this country. Yeah. Um, you, you don't like the music press, I understand. No, to be perfectly honest, no. <laughs> Um, but from the very sort of beginning, I think, uh, as far as say, the musical press is concerned, I mean, they they like, I mean, even now, they like to sort of put, a, put sort of up-and-coming bands into a sort of particular bag for, for what they think. And I think we sort of just rebelled. I mean, we wanted to sort of do what we thought was right and not sort of go along with what they were saying. And I think since the very early stages, we've, there's always been this sort of um, fracas between... Yes, it started between from day the one, with day the release one. of our first album. Plus the fact that before uh, our, our first actual release, we were virtually totally unheard of, and then suddenly we were not particularly famous, but heard of at least. And uh, they always like to think they've got one up on you, and they oh. always like to oh. think they've predicted something. Yes. You know? And then all of a sudden there we were, and, and we were playing to quite a lot of people. And uh, it took people rather by surprise, I think. Was this style, though, that you had created, was that thought out from the outset, or did it just evolve as time went by? There were certain kind of ideals which we had in our heads, definitely certain patterns that we wanted to try and live up to. And I think, to put it crudely, we started off thinking that we wanted to be a, a kind of heavy group, but with good melodies and with good harmonies. And the other things grew out of that. And the first album was really just putting down what we did on stage at the time. It was quick into the studios and quick out. Even at that time, lots of big ideas about what we could do in a studio if we were let loose for a, a proper time in the studio. Um, but we saved all that up to, up to Queen 2, the second album. But a lot of the Queen 2 stuff was written at the time we made the first album. OK, well, let's take some music now from Queen 1. The first track we're going to play is like your first single. Taking that, Queen 1, Keep Yourself Alive.
Keep Yourself Alive, your first single. Brian, were you mm. disappointed that this didn't do better? Oh, yes, yes. It's, it takes me back very vividly to the time, actually, because this is just the time when we started... We did a few gigs on our own, so small gigs, and then went on the support tour with Mott the Hoop and um, went around the whole country getting really good reactions and thinking, yeah, we're really getting somewhere. And yet all the time we were watching the single and the album and nothing appeared anywhere in the charts, you know. And it just seemed like an impossible wall. We thought, how is it done? You know, we couldn't get the single played on the radio at all, hardly. Well, there's a couple of people that played it, but it didn't get any sort of uh, uh, power play. Uh, but there's no doubt that the beginning is the worst. You know, you have no track record, you have no reputation. Yeah. John, can I come to you now? We haven't heard you for you, I'm sorry. You got a degree in electronics. Did this uh, mean that the group all came to you and asked you questions when they had complicated bits of machinery mm, to look at? Not particularly. Um, I used to help a little out in the in the in the early days. You know, when we you know basically when we started out, there was just the four of us and one guy, our roadie John Harris, who's been with us right from the beginning. And um, between me and him, we used to do a lot in the early days. But now we have quite a a larger crew of about 20 who look after it all for us. Well, being in a 32-track studio with all the marvellous space-age electronics all around, do you find it difficult to sort of keep your hands off little buttons and say, what's this, what's that? Um, well, we do. We all, I mean, we all of us um, try to learn what the studio does. I mean, because it helps to get the sounds and the ideas and to do what you want. And we've all taken interest in what it is possible to do in a studio, technically. You know, because I mean, I think if a musician doesn't understand that, it limits, you know, the ideas that they can actually put down on tape. Now, you were playing bass, uh, yes. first of all, with Roger? No, no, I, um, basically I came down to London to university and I was here for about two years. I wasn't playing at all. I used to play when I, before I came to university in sort of groups at school and things like that. And then I gave it up when I came down. And after I was here for about two years, I bumped into, I think it was Roger and Brian somewhere, mm. wasn't I? Yeah. And, and I yeah. heard just socially, because they happened to be at different colleges around the same area in London. And I heard they were looking for a bass player. So I said I was interested and um, went along for an audition, really. And it happened like that. I think you'd been together for about six months previously, hadn't you? I think longer, actually. Yeah. Oh, you with mean Queen, yeah. Queen, actually, Queen with had, the name yeah. Queen. Queen. No, Going through yeah, about three yeah. bass players a week at the time. Yeah. And uh, we eventually found um, John. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I seemed to fit in and, you know... Did you immediately agree on the kind of music you wanted to play? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, they uh, they were already formed. They, I mean, they, I mean, to me, they had the, the I mean, they had all the musical ideas then of what they were trying to do, and I just you know, and I basically you know just fitted in really at that time. He's very modest. Yeah. Well, my development came later. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a few years to settle in. Well, John, mm -hmm. now it's, it's your personal choice. What 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 would you like to play? Yes, now? I'd chosen a track um, by Marvin Gaye. Heard it through the grapevine. Uh, I like a lot of these American sort of Tamla things, but for the bass players, some of the bass players are very Tamla nice. <laughs> you know, love it. Um, you know, and it's a nice atmospheric song. Okay, here it is. Marvin Gaye heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> John, you are a family man, am I right in...? Uh, sort of correct, yes. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have one little boy, yes. Yes, right. No. Do, do you find it difficult touring in the States and being um, away from family? It can be a strain, yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, I try and, um, you know, make the two work together, you know, which is, you know, which is, it can be difficult, but I, I try, and, try and fit it in. How does he react to Daddy being big star? Well, I don't know, he can't talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think he will react? Um, I don't know. I'll see then. He's just starting to talk now, actually, so I'll find out what he's been thinking. John is also the business brain of the group. <laughs> he's a business brain? Mm. I, I look after, I tend to look into that a bit, yeah, some of that. So you're examining the contracts and uh, checking on the returns and... Well, yeah, it is nice, it is, it is especially when you get to, to the level we got to. I mean, it's nice to know what's going on. Uh, Brian, you did a degree in physics and then uh, yes. you went on to do a PhD in astronomy. Yeah. What was the attraction of astronomy? Something I'd always, always been interested in. I was, as a kid, I used to look at the stars and I built a telescope and things. And um, it was just something I thought if I ever had the chance to be an astronomer I would, I would give it a go. So I took a physics degree and I 
I mean, when you're at school, you don't really know what you're going to do. I think I think it's still true. You know, when you when you come out of school, you tend to do what you you're best at, and and if if you happen to be good at physics, everyone tells you you should do physics. So I did that, and it happened to be a good thing to lead on to astronomy. Um, so I did some research in astronomy after I got the degree, but at that time the group began to take off and demand more and more time. So it just became impossible to uh, to carry on with the studies, really. But I believe your PhD thesis, in fact, was practically completely written, wasn't it? Yes, I did. I, I spent a long time. I also taught for a while at a comprehensive school to to make the money to keep going, and did most of the writing up. Um, but it's just for the, the sake of that last bit, mm. and I, I seriously wonder whether it's ever going to get done now. And what was the it's thesis on? Um, interplanetary dust, motion of, of dust between us and the sun. Oh, very cosmic. Mm. Mm. Cosmic. Yeah. <laughs> is there a lot of it? Is there a lot of it? Yes, there's a surprising amount of it, actually, yes. You can, in fact, see it if you're in the right place at the right time. In a very clear sky, in a very dark sky, you can see... Uh, you Tell can them see about your zodiacal light. As a, it's called is a zodiacal it, light, yes. Oh, there you are which is a sort of milky glow, which looks something like the Milky Way, but it's a cone of light which stretches up with the sun as a centre. Hmm. Where did you observe from? Because I would have thought London sky at night was a bit murky. Oh, yes. Well, I went to Tenerife. Well, I went to Italy first in the Italian Alps. We had an observatory there, but that was plagued with bad weather. And we went to Tenerife. We set up an observatory on Tenerife. I actually organised a hut being built, which had a, uh, well, not actually a telescope, but a spectroscope, which is what I used. Well, that's for some more music, and what we have coming up is The Seven Seas of Rye. I do like to be beside the seaside. Well, that was the uh, single that broke you, the Seven Seas of Rye, that began it all. Um, Roger, why was there a little bit of Seven Seas of Rye on Queen 1 and then repeated on Queen 2? Well, I think Freddie had half written the song, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it was we thought it was a nice sort of uh, tail out to the first album. With the, I think we had the idea of, of starting the second album with the song. With the finished yeah, song. With the yeah. finished song, yeah. So mm. it would sort of lead in nicely. Mm. In fact, we ended the second album with with this song, um, mm. and it had changed a little by then. And we released it as a single because we mm. thought it was fairly strong. Mm. Freddie, if I count to you as the man what wrote it, the lyrics, what does it mean? Oh, God, you should never ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> basically, um, my sort of li lyrics are sort of uh, basically for people's interpretations, really. And I mean, I think it's... I've forgotten what they're all about. What were the seven seas of Rye? <laughs> it's really fictitious. I know it's like sort of buying us and easy way out, but that's basically what it is. It's it's just um, a figment of your imagination. Really. Uh, you have you have a rather a surrealistic approach. Is that the right word? Could I say to your lyrics? Good to them. An imaginative approach. Yes. <laughs> imaginative. Could, yes. No, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a, an easy way out. The, the, there's a, a covers such a lot of area. It really depends on what kind of song, really. I think. Um, I think at that time I was I was um, learning about a lot of things about actual song structure and uh, and as far as lyrics are concerned they're very difficult as far as I'm concerned I find them uh, quite a task and uh, my strongest point is sort of like say melody content and um, I basically sort of um, concentrate on that first the melody mm. and the song structure and then the lyrics come afterwards actually. Uh, are you influenced by Salvador Dali? Not really. I sort of um, I admire him, yes. It's, sort of, it's, it's not as um, involved as that. I don't sort of take things like paintings too literally. The only time I did do that was in a song called Fairy Fellows Masterstroke, where I actually sort of was, I was thoroughly inspired by um, a painting by Richard Dadd, which is in the Tate Gallery. And I thought that sort of... Uh, uh, did a lot of research on it, and it sort of um, inspired me to write um, a song about the painting, depicting what I thought I saw in it. What did you discover in your research about this painting? Um, it's just because, I mean, I've come through art college and things like that, I just, I basically liked the sort of artist, and mm. I sort of liked the painting, and I thought I'd like to sort of write a song about it. Uh, we're, we're going to play this track, so... Mm. Um, it's, on, it's on Queen too. <laughs> 